Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation on the applications of microbiology, of which there are so many, and a majority of them are absolutely fundamental to our existence. For example, take a breath. And perhaps over the next few minutes, the 11 to 30 breaths that you take every minute, I want you to think about thanking a microorganism because, in fact, more than 50% of our oxygen comes from the microbial world. And while we tend to thank plants for that, which they're very worthy things to thank, we should also think about the microbial world in their ability to replenish our atmospheric oxygen and to, of course, make our respiration possible. But it's not just that particular biogeochemical cycle that microorganisms play a role in. Many of you have heard of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, think about the fact that a majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, and yet we can't use any of it. It's completely unusable N2 gas to us. And in order for it to become something usable to us, the microbial world, in fact, the bacterial world, has to be able to convert that atmospheric nitrogen into usable ammonia that then plants can take up, and then, of course, we can eat those organisms. So it's absolutely essential to cycling nitrogen. And in fact, I was just getting a little bit nerdy and looking at an article uh, about the um, correlation between nitrogen fixation uh, and the microbial world uh, with, within um, early stage soils versus later stage soils. And I found this really uh, fascinating article that talks about the distribution of nitrogen fixing bacteria, but more aptly, it talks about how in areas that are deglaciated due to climate change, there is a change in the composition of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So another interesting thing to think about as we um, experience changes in climate. I've taken a picture here of, uh, in fact, I was out on a long four hour run when I took this sweet picture of a mushroom. And it's a good example of the fact that microorganisms degrade things that we simply cannot degrade. Uh, for example, lignin and cellulose, these are complex polysaccharides that we don't have the enzymes to break down, right? We're not able to chew on a t-shirt the way that a goat does and break that down because we don't have the microorganisms in, in our rumen to do so like cow cattle do, um, but we certainly do not. So the microbial world is essential for decomposing materials that no other organisms are capable of degrading. One of the most important applications of microbiology is in the production of food and the preservation of food. So welcome to my fermentation room at home where I make a traditional probiotic beverage called kombucha. Some of you have probably had it. It's associated with a lot of different health benefits ranging from being anti-carcinogenic to being able to help treat gastric ulcers. So what I do here is I make two different batches of kombucha. And the really cool thing is that the culture is a polydiverse culture, meaning that it's comprised of a lot of different microorganisms, and it gets its name because of that. It's called a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, or a SCOBY. So the SCOBY is actually a diverse pellicle, meaning that it's a cellulosic mat that sits at the top of the fermentation beverage. So what I'm fixing to do right now is to show you and introduce you to one of our SCOBYs. Now we have two SCOBYs. Um, this SCOBY is named Pele because I brought it up from a culture that I got in Hawaii. And this one here is called Scooby-Doo. So I'm going to show you Scooby-Doo today. So if you want to come on closer and take a look at this polydiverse pellicle, you'll see that this almost looks like human tissue. But what it is, is it is a culture of bacteria and yeast. And it includes things like gluconoacetobacter and acetobacter. And these are in combination with things like zygosaccharomyces, a type of yeast, what you're noticing me doing right here is that I'm separating what's called the mother, which is um, the original cellulosic biofilm, from the baby, which is the one that is created as it's been sitting in culture over the last week or so.
So what I will often do is I will rinse this with a little bit of vinegar. And this makes sense because in fact, if you notice those two bacteria, gluconoacetobacter and acetobacter, it, some of you are nerding out in our chemistry people and you know that acetic acid is vinegar. So I often will just clean this a bit with vinegar in between batches. And then I can take this original um, mother, SCOBY, and I can place it back in a new culture of tea. So that's actually what makes kombucha unique is that it is a probiotic beverage made traditionally from tea. So the tea also has wonderful antioxidant properties and all of the other health benefits that we tend to associate with tea. So this is a super cool application of microbiology, but it also touches on this idea of food preservation. Because when we are making acids from our fermented beverages or in fermented cheeses or buttermilk or sour cream, we know that that helps preserve the milk product. So for example, with sour cream, because it's acidic, it has a certain amount of lactic acid, it prevents the growth of pathogens, things like salmonella. So this is a sweet app application of microbiology, mm, Defto is probably my favorite. So not only can microorganisms make food, but they can also degrade things as food that we would never dream of eating for dinner. So for example, TNT. It's what's for dinner. <laughs> if you're a microorganism that's capable of utilizing nitrogenous explosive compounds as your source of energy, and there are some that can. In fact, there's a process called the Sab Sabre process that enables microorganisms in a bioreactor to convert TNT into TAT, so trinitrotoluene into triaminotoluene, and make it into something that is not explosive and is readily degradable. So this is a process called bioremediation. I mean, what a sexy-minded term is that? Bioremediation, meaning degrading things that are harmful in our environment and converting them to something that is no longer harmful. You might actually recognize the photograph that you see in the background on this picture. Um, every fall, I take my ski team out onto the green belt to do intervals, and they do roller ski intervals around the green belt. Um, you'll notice in the center of the loop of the green belt, there are a great number of trees that have grown up there. And if you look closely, you'll also recognize that amongst the trees, there are also these small um, tubes that come out from the earth that are augmenting the micro microorganisms that live in the rhizosphere, meaning the roots of the trees. And this is a process that is called phytoremediation, but it's a bio-augmentation of the bacteria within the roots of the trees that enable them to degrade oil. And in fact, between 1928, get this, between 1928 and 1982, the railroad company sunk 10,000 gallons of creosote into the ground in this area. Creosote is that, um, uh, uh, the you know, the railroad tie preserving compound. And so uh, in order to get rid of that, the engineers proposed, well, let's just mechanically like flush it out of there. Uh, that didn't work out. Sorry, engineers. <laughs> um, but what did work was this phytoremediation approach. So literally making the bacteria or allowing or enabling the bacteria to chow down on that creosote and to reclaim the land. And now there's a lot of beautiful growth. In, in that area. So bioremediation, perhaps one of my favorite of the applications, but think about the health implications that come with that, the health of our environment as it impacts our health. And if we think about it, the microbial balance in the soils really is um, what impacts our health and in more ways than one. And in fact, I want to talk to you about something that has long been a touted advantage of microorganisms. They are capable of producing antibiotics. So the picture that you see right here is a plate that we will grow later in the semester in our lab. It's a plate that is augmenting the growth of soil microorganisms called streptomyocetes. Now, these amazing bacteria, um, they kind of look like fungi, don't they? They look as though they almost have a mold morphology, and they, they do, they masquerade as molds. But what they do that is phenomenal is they secrete many bioactive compounds, meaning that these are compounds that kill off other microbial life. 
aka antibiotics. So if you've heard of streptomycin, you bet that's made by the streptomyces. That's pretty cool. And there's a lot of great things about antibiotics. They save lives every day. We're going to spend a lot of time, though, in this class talking about selective pressure and antibiotic resistance, the fact that our overuse and misuse of antibiotics has led to a lot of um, resistant populations. And so there is a double-edged sword for these incredible organisms and our use of their antibiotics. We also isolate compounds from microorganisms that make insecticides. And in a moment, we're gonna talk a bit more about that. So there's something called Bacillus thuringiensis, a sweet looking bacterium, a rod shaped bacterium that secretes something that kills insect pests. Now, another application is genetic engineering. And I know that everyone conjures a different image in their mind when I say genetic engineering. But let's define it. It's the introduction of genes from one organism into another to give it new features or abilities. That can span the board. It's actually something that we do in lab every day. It's something that you'll be doing in lab this semester. You're going to take E. coli cells and you're gonna give them DNA, genes, that enables them to glow, to bioluminesce. Pretty sweet, right? Well, you're going to be doing genetic engineering. So that's a form of genetic engineering, taking genes from one organism, putting them into another, giving it new features. I've pulled up an abstract that is super sexy minded. It was published just a couple of months ago, December 2016. And it talks about um, respiratory sinusoidal virus or RSV, really common and really common in children. And if we read through this abstract, RSV live attenuated vaccines, or LAVs, have a history of safe testing in infants. However, achieving an effective balance of attenuation and immunogenicity has proven challenging. Now that sounds sort of technical, but all that means is we have to, with a vaccine, make a um, version of the virus that doesn't cause disease. Um, that's what attenuation means. It means making a version of the virus that won't cause the disease. But then immunogenicity means that it still has to cause our immune system to recognize it as if it were the live virus. And that's kind of a weird term because viruses really aren't considered alive. But it has to, your body has to recognize it and say, Woohoo, RSV, mount the alert. And it has to create all of the immune factors that would be created if you actually had the virus so that you get long lasting immunity to it. So here they seek to engineer an RSV lab with enhanced immunogenicity. So to make it more likely for your body to gain um, long standing uh, immune function against it. So genetic ma mapping identifies strain line 19 fusion protein residues that correlate with prefusion antigen maintenance in Biolyza and thermal stability and activity of live RSV. Wow, there's a lot of things we don't understand in that sentence. But we generate a lav candidate named OE4, which expresses line 19F and is attenuated, so meaning that it doesn't cause disease, by codon deoptimization and non-structural genes. Oh, okay. So they're changing the genes in this particular candidate so that it won't cause disease, but it will cause your immune system to recognize the, the virus. And they did this by deletion of a small water-hating hydrophobic gene. Oh, so they modified this RIV, RSV by deleting the gene that's a water-hating gene that will allow them to both de attenuate and cause immune function to um, be enhanced or immunogenicity. So that's pretty cool. This whole abstract is all about making vaccines using genetic engineering. Here it's to RSV, but this has been done for many other diseases as well. So genetic engineering has a lot of potential, a lot of applications. Um, and a lot of discussions surrounding it. Another major way in which we use genetic engineering, in fact, I would say that this is number one, is that we genetically engineer our crops. So we have what are called GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. And these GMOs are made um, commonly, very commonly, 
with a bacterium that serves as kind of this incredible uh, vector. You could think of it as being like the space shuttle that attacks plants. And typically this, this um, particular plant pathogen, this bacterium called agrobacterium, usually it causes the plant to get a tumor. But what we've managed to do is take out the tumor making gene and replace it with a gene that allows plants to make insecticides. So for example, we've made things, and many of you in agriculture will recognize this, we've made things like Bt corn and Bt cotton that are resistant, and remember that bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, that makes the um, insecticide? Well, now the plants make their own insecticides. So we're genetically engineering using a bacterium uh, to deliver the genes. And that's pretty common. We, we like to do that a lot. We like to use bacteria or viruses to deliver genes to modify organisms to do genetic engineering. And in fact, that's what gene therapy is. Um, for example, in gene therapy, we will take a, for example, an adenovirus, a type of virus, and use it to um, be like a, a space shuttle to go in and uh, change, give new genes to cancerous tissues and treat the cancer that way. That's called gene therapy. Now, this uh, genetic engineering, particularly when we're talking in agriculture, has a lot of interesting implications. And this abstract really goes into that. If you think about the fact that when we make plants make their own insecticides, and we have these large fields of insecticide making plants, then what will happen is that the insects are under a selective pressure, meaning that they're exposed to these insecticides all the time. And so what we know about natural selection is that that means that the insects that are resistant are selected for. So the resistant quote unquote pests, right? The insects, they sometimes call them pests. The, those populations obviously are gonna succeed. So the ones that are resistant succeed and we gradually over time select for those that are resisting the insecticides that the plants are making. This abstract talks about this, and look, it was published this, this month, like literally now. So resistance has evolved to single transgenic traits engineered into crops for arthropod and herbicide resistance. So this is saying resistance to insects, arthropods, pests, or resistance to herbicides, meaning we often will give plants, okay, you've heard of Roundup Ready plants, Roundup Ready crops, we will give them plants the ability to resist the herbicides so that we can spray them with herbicides and we kill the non-resistant weeds and we let the crops grow. So by genetically engineering them that way, we, we allow that. Okay, so this can be expected to evolve to more um, recently introduced pathogen resistances. So saying again, we are putting selective pressure um, on the, for example, the arthropod population that are the insect pests. So combining transgenes against the same target pests is being promoted as a solution to the problem. This solution will work if used preemptively, but where resistance has evolved to one member of a stack, resistance should easily evolve to a second gene in most cases. So let's see what they're saying here. What they're saying is usually we go in and we modify a single gene within these GMO crops. But what they're arguing is could we modify two genes instead? And then it would be less likely that we would select for resistant insects, for example. Their abstract is saying, well, yes, but we have to be very proactive about that if we're going to be able to do that. So I believe this is a beautiful segue um, into discussing major philosophical, um, ethical, scientific, and etc. questions that um, surround genetic engineering. So I want you to pause the vodcast right now, and I want you to write a list of things that are running around in your mind at this time about what are all of these questions that come to mind when you think about genetic engineering, 
I hope you came up with a lot of great answers or questions, I guess I should say. And one of the ones that I'm going to begin with that I ponder the most is this idea of selective pressure, because I think it is undoubtedly occurring and it is perhaps one of our most arduous uh, tasks in addressing selective pressure um, and resistance. So we know that with the um, use of genetically engineered crops that we are indeed selecting for insects that are resistant to the insecticides that we've modified the plants to produce. So sometimes this is called superbugs. Um, it's one term that is kind of a popularized term for this idea. So we know that selective pressure does indicate natural or in this case, maybe um, <laughs> artificial selection. So let's just say this selection for resistant insects, that's an example. But anytime we um, have a monoculture of crops that all are genetically engineered in the same way, um, we know that they are identically selecting, but we also know that they are identical with regards to their um, weaknesses as well. So when we think about the fact that we have monocultures, monocultures say you have an entire um, set of fields in an agricultural region that all grow BT corn and cotton, well, they're all genetically identical, they're clones of one another. And so these monocultures are all susceptible to the same diseases. So monocultures lack biodiversity and thus are susceptible to the same pathogens. In general, there's around 10% biodiversity in any naturally occurring population, and so the um, ability for a population to persist when, in the face of disease is inherently built in. But in the case of monocultures that are GMOs, that is not the case because of their um, genetic identity. So this is another important thing to ponder. Now, undoubted, undoubtedly, as you were making your list, you probably came up with this really popularized question, um, which is designer babies, right? What about this notion that if we can genetically engineer an, um, in, uh, within germline gene therapy, So germline gene therapy, meaning that we make the um, genetic modifications within the gametes or fertilized ova, and so we're changing the um, child before it is born. That's why it's called germline gene therapy. And so, of course, this gives rise to those questions of how do we define a disease? Right? I think this is, um, this is a very difficult question that comes from this. And I know that some of you have very dear friends who maybe are deaf and you know that they identify with their deafness with a great deal of pride and it is a form of their identity and they don't consider themselves to be to have a disease. Um, those of us in the queer community, we identify with that um, vast spectral identity as being something that is we're celebrating it's not considered to us a disease and so this is a really hard question isn't it when it comes to that now people tend to be more supportive of things that are um, done through using what we call uh, somatic cell gene therapy Um, that is, we're making changes in an adult, so you're actually modifying a, a particular tissue and particularly targeting a tissue. Maybe there's an ocular disease. You target the tissue within an adult rather than at the germline, um, at, at the fertilized ova or gamete stage. 
So these are all long and arduous questions, things that we would need to have coffee to, to discuss and perhaps we'll do that sometime soon. So these are all important questions. Um, there are certainly many others. I do want to hit on one more and this is just this idea of who owns genes. And with that, um, you know, when we think about Monsanto, for example, owning the BT corn or BT cotton genes and the way in which they uh, enforce that ownership if uh, seeds escape one farmer's land and gets into a neighboring land, they can sue the farmer for um, using seeds that they didn't purchase and so that that ownership of genes is an issue. Now when we start to think about this within um, gene therapy this becomes even more troubling because if uh, a company, a corporation owns genes then who benefits? So who owns genes and thus who suffers and who benefits? And I'll just jot a note here um, that maybe is helpful technologies like this and really all technology widen socioeconomic gaps. Uh, what I mean by that is when you ask if there, um, if suddenly there is a germline gene therapy treatment available for Tay-Sachs disease, a fatal neural degenerative disease, that particular technology would undoubtedly be owned by corporations um, and would undoubtedly be made available to uh, socioeconomically advantaged privileged groups before it would be made available to socioeconomically disadvantaged groups. And so this is an issue, right? Who benefits? Who owns genes um, and who benefits? But I want to turn our attention to our next conversation and I want to talk about the Hollywoodized <laughs> microorganisms. That is, we think a lot about germs, quote unquote, which unfortunately is representative of by far the minority. And maybe that's why I think of it as Hollywood, right? A majority of Americans are not Hollywood stars, <laughs> said another way. A vast majority of microorganisms are not pathogens, but the pathogens get all of the attention, the germs that cause disease. And maybe to a certain extent, or at least historically, that's warranted. So if we ask the question, which one of the following killed the most Americans? World War I, World War II, World War, or the Korean War and the Vietnam War, combined, or the flu between 1918 and 1919, which one of those killed the most Americans? And of course, everybody always tells me, Rachel, this is a no-brainer. This is microbiology. So I'm quite certain that it is pro the answer to this question is probably D. Um, but what if I told you that in fact D killed more than A, B, and C combined? So in fact, in the throes of World War I is when we experienced the um, influenza, the H1N1 influenza, uh, and the 1918-1919 uh, flow of, uh, influenza killed um, more than half a million Americans. Now, if you compare that to what was killed in World War I, it was around 116,000. So it is vastly outnumbering, and yet we, we talk far more about World War I. In 1918 and 1919, the worldwide Spanish influenza outbreak sickened one of every four people and caused over half a million deaths in the United States. The flu caused social disruption and massive loss of life on American soil when the nation was already in the throes of war. Influenza overtook the U.S. in three lethal waves, incapacitating our cities at its peak in the fall of 1918. Baltimore, like other major cities, was heavily affected. Two-thirds of pandemic-related deaths occurred in October alone. Over 3,000 people succumbed to the disease. A severe worker shortage curtailed industrial production and government services. At least 25% of public safety officials failed to report for duty. Transportation, food supply, and communication networks were equally in peril. Grave diggers, also afflicted with flu, could not keep up with the demand for burials. Morgues were overflowing 
Some were handling 10 times their normal capacity. Already taxed by wartime conditions, medical, nursing, and hospital services buckled under the onslaught of acutely ill and dying patients. Over one-third of doctors and even more nurses were serving overseas. Other critical support positions, orderlies, custodians, cooks, were equally understaffed. Not only was the 1918-1919 uh, influenza devastating, but if you even go further back in history and think about microbial um, epidemics, for example, between 1346 and 1350, 25 million people died of the bubonic plague. So remember playing uh, Ring Around the Rosie when you were young. That song is all about the bubonic plague or the Black Death. They all fall down. Um, another good example is that um, smallpox has killed about 10,000 people over the past 4,000 years. Um, if you think about the way in which Cortez conquered the Aztecs, he had one lethal weapon and that was the smallpox virus. And really that was true also of um, sometimes the intentional warfare, biological warfare that was used against the indigenous peoples um, during the, um, the takeovers by the French and English in, in what is now become our nation. So medical microbiology or the study of pathogenic or disease-causing microorganisms is a pretty big deal historically. And um, I've taken actually two pictures here at the bottom. When I was bike touring in Selby and York in England, I found a cholera uh, burial ground. And in fact, if you were to look at the top leading causes of death uh, at the turn of the century around 1900, you would find that cholera was amongst those leading causes of death. So cholera being one of the diarrhea diseases, so diarrhea was what was listed as the cause of death. But also, of course, amongst that would be tuberculosis. This is actually a picture I took in the museum in York, where you can see this person has systemic tuberculosis that actually killed, um, that, that killed him. So this was actually someone in the Greco-Roman time um, in the upward, mig the northward migration of the Romans. So a huge deal historically, but I think it is important to note that um, pathogens still are something that we do need to think about. And I would argue that AIDS or HIV AIDS is still the pandemic that defines your generation. We'll talk more about that this semester. Um, some of you might have been hearing about things like valley fever, and this kind of thing is on the rise. And a big reason for that is climate change, because as we see the um, drought uh, associated with the uh, mobilization of dry soils, we see the increased um, uh, dust in the air and dust associated with disease. We also see the increased ability for uh, vectors. Vectors are things like mosquitoes that carry disease, being able to get to places that they couldn't go before because of the warming. Um, and so we're seeing transmission of disease changing. We're also seeing that because of the way in which we travel internationally. And I'm certainly a great representative of that, right? I'm in Kazakhstan probably right now as your um, watching this vodcast. Um, so if I contracted something there, I would easily spread it all over the world before I came home with all of the various layovers in Turkey and, um, and whatnot. So it would get spread throughout um, different nations. Now, we also are seeing a lot of chronic um, diseases being associated with microorganisms where we didn't think they were before. We used to think that peptic ulcers was caused by stress, and while they might be worsened by stress, we also know that they're associated with a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori, one of my favorites, and uh, an incredible, resourceful, smooth criminal that can bore into your stomach lining. And maybe one of the biggest issues that I promise we will discuss, we will discuss literally, it is disgusting, but we will discuss literally every day antibiotic resistance. So this idea that we have overused and misused antibiotics, and because of that, we have put a selective pressure on those microorganisms that are already resistant, those populations have survived and thrived. And for example, now Staphylococcus aureus is resistant almost as a general rule to what in the 1950s would have affected it. Penicillin, right, is an antibiotic that in the 1950s would have worked, no longer works today. Now, this being said, it is really important that we understand 
that microorganisms in general are not pathogens, right? As I said, these are the Hollywood movie stars of the microbial world. They are in no way representative of what is the general rule of the microbial world. So recognize that in fact, um, we will speak greatly about the microbiome. So our body is covered and our skin has trillions of microorganisms. That is our skin microbiome, our oral microbiome, our gut microbiome. We're understanding the ways in which the microbiome is associated with health. We recognize a causation between microbiome populations in the gut and obesity, which I know directly interest several of you. Um, we also recognize that there are correlations between um, your dental health, which I also know um, will interest several of you, um, and your, your human microbiome, your oral microbiome. So I suggest that you find your way to the NIH Human Microbiome Project, Project website and read just a little bit of that and challenge yourself, um, those of you doing Microbiology Go as your uh, extra credit option to make a post on the Microbiology Go threads and tell everyone more about what you learned about the Human Microbiome Project um, and uh, a little bit of what maybe was the most interesting finding to you. And we'll leave today with saying that microorganisms not only are incredible components of our ecosystem, right? When one of my favorite things is to think about the human body as a planet and all of our different portions of our human body as ecosystems and really how that parallels the earth as an ecosystem and its many different microbial um, inhabitants. So it's pretty cool. Um, but also microorganisms are great for model organisms in the lab. And in fact, a sexy minded quote by a man named Jacques Monod, who said, um, what is true of E. coli is true of an elephant. So if we learn about glycolysis in E. coli, we also learn about glycolysis in an elephant. Um, so uh, let's leave it at that. And thank you so much for joining me for this conversation.